in this video, I'm going to show you how you can create an animated mouse cursor, or uh, yeah, I should maybe say an animated spider cursor. So yeah, if you do have a fear of spiders, uh, I apologize. Um, but I, I think this guy looks pretty cute. So I'm going to teach you how you can set up an animation in Arrive that creates the spider. We're not going to do it uh, step by step. I'm just going to show you the important parts. And this will also be a discussion on what to consider from a code perspective, as we will also look at the implementation of how uh, you can add this animation to a Flutter application. It's worth noting that um, this is technically possible to do in a variety of different runtimes. The implementation will only be slightly different. The arrive portion should be exactly the same. Um, what will be different is uh, maybe it's just some platform specific stuff. For example, disabling the mouse cursor. As you can see here, the uh, mouse cursor is missing, but like on the actual window, like outside of the window, you can see the system cursor, but in the app, it's just rendering as this dot. And that dot is uh, just to like uh, show you where the spider should be aiming towards. But yeah, this is a really <laughs> fun animation to do. Um, I'm quite proud of the way that it turned out, uh, the legs especially. Uh, I think it can obviously still be perfected, um, but quite happy for uh, the time spent. What I really love about this animation is that uh, you'll see that the left leg does an actual click. Uh, it's maybe a bit more visible here. Uh, same for right click. This app doesn't have any right click behavior, but uh, if you press the right mouse button, then it uh, uses its right front leg. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, with that said, let's actually just jump into this video and start with the implementation. In the description below, I've provided a link to the code. So if you want to run this interactively in your browser, you can just experiment with the app uh, immediately and also take a look at the code uh, in your own time. But yeah, later on in this video, we will be taking a look at this uh, step by step and explain what is actually happening over here. Okay, so let's jump into the animation portion of this video. And we're not gonna be recreating this from scratch. Uh, instead, I'm just gonna show you the important parts that you need to take note of. Um, but I'm sure by the end of this, you'll have a very good idea of um, exactly how this is implemented, uh, especially once you also take a look at the code. Um, but yeah, let's start off by just demoing the animation. So you'll see that we have one state machine. Uh, also worth noting that I will be sharing this uh, to the community so you can remix this and get the file and play with it yourself and modify it. Uh, so yeah, we have a state machine called spider machine and it has a number of different inputs. These inputs are controlled uh, from the runtime code and that is what uh, allows our spider to walk and turn and perform clicks. So as an example, if we press left click, uh, you can see the left click, right click, right click. Um, and then uh, we have the speed input, and this is a blend between walking and running. So it goes from zero to 100, and we'll delve into all of these and how they're set up in a moment. I just quickly wanna demo everything. And next up we have this turn. And turn is, it might actually be better to view it without uh, the speed. Uh, applied. So with turn, you can see that uh, it goes from zero to 100 and it just uh, like shivvies the legs from left to right. And this gives us a little bit of uh, extra behavior in the app. So while you are moving the mouse cursor left and right really fast maybe, or if it's just doing a rotation, uh, it looks a little bit better from, uh, uh, I guess, uh, a lifelike perspective if there's more movement uh, as opposed to just like forward and back. So let's put this back at zero. And um, the final thing is rotate. And rotate, as you can see, rotates the body. And this is also, again, um, once the, in the runtime application, if you move the mouse cursor, the mouse, uh, the spider needs to turn to follow the mouse. So there's some elements of like uh, applying this turn and the rotate. And that gives a little bit of a unique behavior or a different 
looking turn each time. And you'll note that for uh, rotates, it's a little bit different. It goes from minus 100 to 100. And um, that's just because it can turn left and right. Okay, so that is the intro to the state machine. I think what we should probably look at is these one by one and these different layers and see how they are applied. But before we delve into that, let's quickly go back and take a look at the design and just see how this particular design is set up and, and the things that we will be making use of from an animation perspective. Um, so yeah, let's take a look at the top level. Uh, here we have our spider. It's a group called spider. And we have uh, two groups. We have a right targets group and a left targets group. And as you can see, each one of these has a number of targets that are applied uh, within the group. So right being the right target and left being the left target. We're gonna get back to that this in a moment, but uh, this is um, quite important as it allows us to um, do additional things that would have been, I think, impossible uh, without it. And I'll touch on that in a moment. But for now, let's ignore that it groups into these and just focus on the individual targets. And as an example, we will take a look at the right one target. So that's the right leg number one target. As you can see, it's at the very point of where the leg is pointing to. And this target controls the right leg. So if we move this, uh, the right leg moves as well. And as you can see, the right leg is uh, controlled using bones. So that's what gives that kind of fluid behavior uh, so that it looks like uh, it's behaving like an actual leg. And if we take a look at our right one leg, so this one over here, and we open this, you can see that um, it has three shapes. And this is true for each of the legs. We have the first shape, a second shape, and the third shape. And each of these shapes are assigned to each of these bones. So we have three bones in each leg, and the three shapes are uh, tied to those bones. So if we take a look at the uh, top one, and let's just zoom into that, you can see that it's bound, uh, yeah, sorry, it's bound to bone two. And if you wanted to uh, bind bones, you would do that by selecting the path, hitting bind bones, and then selecting the bone that you want to apply to, and then clicking done. I'm not gonna do that now as it's already applied. And each of these shapes are assigned to a different bone. And now that we understand that, we can take a look at the uh, actual bones. And the important part for this is that these bones have a, a translation applied to them, and it also has an IK constraint applied to them. We'll take a look at the translation in a moment. But if we take a look at the last bone in the sequence, so bone two, you can see it has a constraint. Um, so you add a constraint, you choose the uh, constraint you want. In this instance, it's an IK constraint. And an IK constraint can be uh, bound to a bone. So if we take a look at the properties over here, you can see that it has um, strength, the name, and the bone count. Uh, what we care about now for this sample of this animation is the target of the IK constraint and the bone count. So if we take a look at the target that is defined, if you hit this button, then you can select the target that you want to follow. And that can be anything. In this instance, it's just this empty group that is a target group. And the correct one is the R1 target. So this one over here. And as a reminder, that is this target that we uh, talked about in the beginning. So that is how the bones follow the target as it's, mo uh, it's moving ab about on the screen. And it's important here that we set the bone count as the bone count uh, basically says how many bones are affected. If we were to change this to two as an example, then only the uh, first two bones will be affected. Uh, same for one. We want to ensure that it happens to all three of the bones. You can experiment with this and see what the difference would be if you were to take that out. And each of these legs are uh, essentially doing the same. Uh, we have targets defined for them, and these targets are what we animate in the animate mode. As an example, if we hop on over to animate, 
and we take a look at the walk animation, you can see that here we have the R1 target. And let me just move this. As we animate this, you can see that we are animating the target and the bones and the vectors attached to those bones are following uh, that. And uh, the bones are determining what the optimal uh, positioning should be for uh, the leg. Okay, so let's jump back to the animate mode, uh, sorry, the design mode, and we will explore one more thing that we need to note of legs. And that is that in the root bone, we have another constraint applied and that constraint is a translation constraint and the target is the body. And uh, you'll see it's body target R1. And if we take a look at body target R1, you'll note that uh, within the body of the spider, we have a number of different targets defined as well. And as you can see, as I'm scrolling over these, you can see the targets are basically the uh, base of the legs. Uh, so there's probably other ways we could have done this as well. This is how I chose to do it. But yeah, body target R1, if we zoom into that, you can see there it is. And the root bone is just uh, following that. And what that means is if we move the body, it doesn't do anything. Uh, if we move the parent body, that's the one we want to move. If we move this, you can see the, uh, the targets are attached to the body. So that means the bones are following it as well. Um, so that is how the legs are attached to the body and move in a fluid way. I guess that's the correct word. If we now jump back to the animate mode, we can explore a bit more and what's happening with this walk cycle. And I think that's probably a good place to start as we've already explored it. Uh, but I'll show you how we can set up uh, the state machine and how we can control the speed of the walk cycle um, uh, with an input. Nothing too complicated here. We are just keying uh, the values for each of these target legs. But if we take a look at the run cycle, uh, the run animation, you can see that um, here it's uh, configured a little bit differently. And uh, the difference is, is that it's uh, basically the same keys, but they are grouped closer together. And um, they also stretch a little bit further. So the legs are moving a little bit further than they would uh, in the walk cycle. Um, Something to take note of is for this uh, timeline, we have it set up to be a loop and we also have a work area defined here. So if you go over here, uh, no, nope, where is it? Oh, here we go. Uh, select a work area. Uh, we want a work area defined because we only want to be looping over this work area and not the whole timeline. Same for the walk. Okay, so with that said, we have our walk animation, our run animation. If we now go to Spider Machine and we will take a look at the uh, walk layer, you can take a note that uh, we have a blend over here. And this blend is what allows us to speed up the animation or the walk cycle. And um, if we wanted to create this from scratch, we'll, let's actually just demo that. What you'll need to do is click add blend uh, states. Then once you have the blend state, uh, you can add the timelines. So uh, in this instance, we need three timelines. I know I've only showed you two. That is because there's a, an additional one that I didn't cover and that is the walk off. Meaning that uh, nothing is happening, the character is standing still or the spider is standing still. Um, maybe the, I could have done a better name than walk off. But if we take a look at uh, this animation over here, it's just a one shot animation and uh, nothing happening here. The only thing that's happening is that we are keying the starting positions for all of these targets. And it's not animating, it's remaining consistent. And we do need that to set up the correct blend for our animation. And the reason for that is because these blends are set up in such a way that you define the positions that the blend would occur. So what do I mean by that? As you can see, we have 0, 50, and 100. If we play our animation, 
as we slowly uh, get the speed up, eventually once we reach 50, you'll see that this arrow is at the 50 position. That means that uh, basically 100% of the walk animation is playing now. This should functionally look the same as the walk animation. So if we pause it here, go to walk and play this animation, it should technically look the same. Uh, and this is the way that we can create these blends between different animations and to do it smoothly. Eventually, if we start uh, going above 50, the walk animation will blend with the run animation. And then finally, once we go to 100, uh, the run animation will play in its entirely, uh, entirety. And that is how we set up a blend. Something else to take note of is that we are transitioning from the any state and we are doing that if the speed is bigger or equal to zero. And we also have a duration, and this is the duration that the blend will occur, uh, or the transition will occur to the state. And we're setting that to 250 milliseconds. You can actually note that happening once we enter play mode. So the moment we enter play mode, you can see it transitions uh, from any state to blend. And you'll also note that the starting positions change because what is uh, currently set for the targets during design time is actually different than what it is in the uh, walk off animation. And you'll note that it slowly animates, well, s slowly, pretty fast, animates using this 250 milliseconds duration uh, the moment you uh, engage the, uh, the state machine, if that's the correct way to put it. And that is the walk cycle. And in a similar way, uh, turn is set up like that, and rotate is also set up like that. And we'll quickly explore these in a second. An important thing I did forget before we continue is that uh, if we go back to this blend for the walk, the actual thing that controls the value is the speed, uh, as we saw over here. But it's important to actually set this speed as an input. And um, you'll only see these filled in once you have input defined, uh, inputs defined. So if you need to create a new input, so you just click the plus and select the correct one. These are number inputs that we are currently taking a look at. Okay, so that's, uh, that is the walk cycle. Something that you may have noticed as well is that we have these two extra uh, transitions over here coming from the any state, left click and right click. And as the names say, uh, those are the left clicks and right clicks. So if we take a look at this over here, if we press the left click trigger, you can see that animation happens and it slowly builds up. And if we take a look at the animation timeline for left click, all this does is it sets the position for the left legs target. And it smoothly interpolates from the current uh, state uh, to the left click state by adding a duration and setting the interpolation value over here. So this interpolation value can be uh, controlled with these handles and it can allow you to smoothly transition between different states. So just to show you again, if we play this and click left click or right click, then uh, it works. But it would also work if we were walking and if we press left click or right click. Uh, so that's really awesome. And um, the reason that it's also part of this walk cycle is because um, this walk cycle, as we saw, is animating the targets for the legs. So just to remind you, if we go to walk and go to run, all of these keyframes are targeting the legs uh, targets. And the fact that we're animating them means that um, it makes sense for it to be in this walk layer over here. If we were to add another layer over here and animate uh, the click, for example, here, then there would be no way for us to smoothly transition between them, uh, the states. Uh, this layer would functionally override the layer uh, that is here. So um, I think we can probably just demo that as an example. So let's add the left click uh, here and transition to that. And we'll do the same, uh, make it 300 milliseconds and just leave it as linear. 
and now if we play um the reason it's it's automatically going into that uh we forgot, forgot to add a condition so we'll add a condition and we'll say left click so the condition is if you press left click uh this fire trigger then it will go into that so now if we click it uh, you'll see it's not transitioning back and let's actually go back to walk and i'm just going to remove this for now and play and left click so you'll see that uh, it is smoothly going to that, but it's not going back. And um, it's also like overriding uh, what we have in the walk. So if we increase the speed now, uh, the position is, is set to uh, a state that is defined by this layer. And that is the reason that I decided to uh, not have a different layer, but just do it within the walk and instead have these conditions um, I don't want to do that. And these conditions, uh, yeah, are defining for you when it should be entering these states. So I'm just going to say left click again at the 300 milliseconds duration. And we'll just add a bit of a curve to this. Let's make sure it's still working. And that looks fine. Okay. And I think for next, what we should talk about is this discussion about the target. You may uh, wonder what's the best way now to do the turning, because if we take a look at the turn animation, it is also updating the target, but it's actually not. It's actually updating a group. And that is what we saw earlier by grouping these targets within a parent. So in this particular animation, if we uh, jump to the turn layer. You can see uh, it's quite simple. We have one blend and it's blending between turn off and turn. And uh, turn off, if we jump to that, uh, it's just a key at the start for the right targets group and the left targets group. And what that's, this means is that if we move the left target, it's moving all of the legs uh, on the left side. And for the right targets, it's moving all of the le uh, legs on the right, as we see here. But let's just undo that. We don't want to uh, key anything. And if we go to the actual uh, turn animation and we play this, uh, it looks a little bit janky, but I think it works decently well in the app uh, once the spider is walking as well. Uh, you'll see that uh, we're just keying these two groups. And what that allows is um, it ensures that the turn and the walk do not uh, interfere with each other. Because in the walk layer, uh, we have animations that are keying each of the individual legs targets. In the turn one, we are animating the parent group. So we're not interfering with those animation keys. And instead it's blending it in, uh, in an optimal way. So as an example, if we just play and we increase the speed and then increase the turn, they're not interfering, they're blending in a way that makes sense. And the reason for that is also because the left targets are, uh, because they're grouped underneath the, uh, the this parent over here, the animations are uh, dependent on the parent. If you move the parent's position, you functionally move all of their positions as well uh, in the global coordinate space, but not in the local space. They are keyed in their local values. So if we uh, again play the animation and turn up the speed and turn up the turn value, that is how we can create a nice looking blend. And uh, again, you can right click and left click and it just works. The last thing that we will take a look at for the movements of the spider is the rotation value. So as you can see, we uh, can rotate the spider. And this is a very simple animation. Uh, all we're doing is going into a blend with uh, rotate off, uh, rotate left, rotate right. Difference here is uh, rotate left has a value of minus 100 and rotate right uh, plus 100 and the input value is rotate. And um, if we take a look at the rotate off, as you would 
uh, expect. This is just keying the body's uh, starting position or starting rotation. So you'll see uh, the value for the rotation is zero. And then rotate left, uh, the value is minus 30. Rotate right, it's plus 30. And we are just now smoothly interpolating uh, over that uh, range as we increase the rotation input and decrease the rotation input. And again, if we increase the speed, it does look a little bit uh, weird. I, I, didn't, I acknowledge that. But in the app uh, and how the code is set up, you don't really see the rotation that often. And if you do, it's, it's quite fast. Um, so yeah, that's the setup for the movements of the character. The last two animations that we will take a look at is idle. And uh, you'll, you can see this is just from an empty state to an idle state, um, idle animation, sorry. And this idle body is um, just a key value for the body position. So if we uh, play this, you can see it just moves the body of the spider in various different positions. And because of the targets that we uh, defined for the legs, it means that the legs stay in place, but they move along with the body. And the final animation that we'll take a look at is blink. And here we have, uh, again, a loop animation. And the duration is a little bit longer at six seconds, as we don't want it to be blinking continuously or like too fast. And uh, all this does, it just does a blink. And the blink is using different paths. So if we go to design mode and take a look at the, uh, let's just close some of these. We take a look at the body. We have eyelid left, uh, left and eyelid right. So let's just change the color of this. You can see that uh, it is this shape over here. And in the animate mode, we are keying the uh, actual vertex positions. So uh, the actual path. And the path that we are, let's take a look at the left one. Uh, the path that we have keyed, you can see the uh, vertex positions are changing. So let's just open this. And there we go. And uh, you can take a look at this uh, in your own time. It's not always uh, optimal to key these uh, vertex, uh, vertices as uh, it does add uh, more uh, storage to the file because all of these positions need to be stored. But for something this unique and uh, to get that perfect motion, uh, it, it is needed. But if you alternatively just key bones, as we're doing for the majority of this uh, animation, the end result will be a smaller file. Um, I think that's basically that. Let's just go back and I just wanna change the color back to black. You also notes that for the blinking animation, uh, the, the pupil of the spider animates a little bit before uh, the blink happens. And if we play everything together, uh, you should see that you know every six seconds the spider will blink. And yeah, that is the state machine. The next step for us will be to take a look at the code implementation and understand how we can uh, ensure that these are inputs are used correctly and that we get the end result that we are looking for. Okay, so just as a reminder, this is what the uh, app looks like with our spider friend over here. Uh, open to name suggestions in the comments if you have any names for this guy. Uh, so yeah, I sorry, I, I'm gonna get to the actual code now. I just get distracted playing with this. Just a reminder, you can get the code in the description down below. If you open it, you'll note that there are three different files, uh, main, spider controller, and the UI page. The UI page over here is everything that is not the spider. Uh, so this is the actual resets and the counter and the app bar. And it's literally just there to act as a, a sample application. So for the purpose of this video, we're not going to look at this at all. You can note that in main.dot, we create a material app 
and in the material app we pass in this counter page that is the UI page that Dart uh, that widget is defined in there and that is what controls uh, the UI. Um, something to note before we go deeper into the code is um, this can apply for any language uh, this particular animation you can create this using JavaScript and HTML. You can create this with our Mac OS runtime, uh, or you can uh, probably create it with a variety of other runtimes as well. And um, the code that we will take a look at are somewhat Flutter specific, but um, the concepts will definitely apply to other languages as well. So let's take a look. The other uh, implementation stuff for this uh, application is just theming. So th that's the dark mode and the light mode. So we're not gonna uh, really take a look at that. And um, what we will take a look at is the spider mouse widget. And uh, this is where all of the logic is happening that controls the spider. So let's jump into it. You'll see that we are extending single ticket provider state mixin, which I don't know if we even need. I initially did that for a different reason. Uh, let's just restart the application. Yep, it still works fine. <laughs> um, you would have needed that for normal Flutter animations. What we should care about is the fact that we have a ticker. And this ticker is a way that we are setting the position for the spider. Because uh, we are not only relying on the arrive animation we also need to animate the position. As we saw in the editor, uh, this position isn't animated through Arrive. Uh, we need a way to do this through code. So to slowly uh, change the position of the spider, for example, like when we put the cursor at uh, the top of the screen and then just quickly move it back to the bottom, um, that position of the spider is slowly updating over time. And that is what we're using this ticker for. And if we take a look, at where we are using that, you'll see that. Let me just zoom in a bit. And yeah, this works better. Uh, where we have this ticker, um, we are calling the ticker in the setup method over here. So we're creating a ticker, and this ticker takes a callback. And this callback um, gives us the elapsed time since the previous frame. No. No, it gives us the elapsed time that this ticker has been running. And uh, here we're passing in a method. And as you can see, it takes in the elapsed time. And here we are doing some calculation to get the delta time between the previous uh, frame. And um, I'm not gonna go into the math behind this, but, but uh, it just tells you how much time passed between the uh, previous frame and this frame. And we need that to smoothly uh, step the position of the spider and the rotation actually as well. And we'll see that in a moment. But what we want to actually take a look at is the fact that um, we are calling start on the ticker. So that means the moment that uh, our animation uh, or this widget is created, we are starting this ticker and this on tick will be called uh, each frame. Actually not sure if it will be uh, each frame it will actually just be called uh, for these durations. I think it might have been better to use uh, the Flutter animation widget for this purposes, but uh, this is the code. Um, so in the onTick method, we are calling set state, and set state will ensure that the build method is being called again. So here we have the build method. So that means that all of these widgets uh, within the build will be recreated and um, the position where we set in this transform that we'll explore in a moment will also be updated. And uh, that is how we smoothly change it over time. So um, maybe not the most optimal implementation, we can definitely improve this and not call set states if it's not needed. I'll, I'll leave that as an exercise for you. Um, but the important thing to take note of is that uh, we do need to actually control some of the animation outside of Arrive for this particular use case. And the logic for how the spider moves, that is controlled 
uh, in this class that we called spider controller. And if we take a look at our files, you'll see the spider controller file over here. And here uh, we will delve into this in a moment deeply, um, but let's just see what is happening underneath. Uh, for now, take note that the spider controller takes in um, a arrive state machine and using that, it is calling the correct inputs on the state machine and is also slowly interpreting the spider's rotation and its position and then the values uh, that we need uh, are setting for the state machine. So we saw the setup uh, method and saw that we're calling uh, ticker.start. What we're also doing is calling setup arrive file. And um, in the setup arrive file, we are uh, taking out the logic of controlling uh, arrive animation and um, doing some of the logic ourselves instead of just passing in um, the animation name. If you are familiar with the arrive flutter runtime, you would know that uh, normally if you wanted to create arrive animation, you would just pass in the name like this and it would get uh, the file from the assets folder. Um, we aren't doing that in this instance. We are instead reading the arrive file ourselves. So this is uh, getting the file from the assets directory. And if we take a look, you'll see we have this folder called assets and the spider.rev is in that. And if we scroll down, go to pubsec.yaml, we should have noticed, I should have talked about this at the start. We are adding the assets folder because we are including the rev file in our package as a bundle. And we are also adding the arrive package as a dependency. Um, for this video, if you want to follow along, uh, take notes of what the version is or just get the completed code from the link in the description. Uh, so yeah, in the setup arrive file, we are reading this file. And then from this file, we are getting the artboard and the artboard name is called spider. And if it is null, because this can be null if you give the incorrect name, uh, we just throw an exception. Otherwise, we create a new instance for the artboard and then we create a controller. So we call state machine controller from artboard, we pass in the artboard and then we pass in the name of the state machine. So just to make sure you understand, uh, the name of the uh, artboard is called spider. You'll actually note that there are other artboards here as well that I need to clean up. And there's also a state machine called spider, uh, spider machine. You can call this whatever you want. And uh, as long as the name matches what is defined in the editor, it should find it. And then uh, if the controller is not null, we set the state machine controller. Um, and the reason we store a local version of this is because later on in our app, we are calling uh, dispose on the state machine controller. So within the dispose override, we stop the ticker, dispose the ticker, and dispose the state machine controller. So that is if the widget gets destroyed. And then finally, uh, we call add controller on the artboard and we pass in the state machine. So once the setup arrive file is complete within the on setup over here, then we create the spider controller. And then for the spider controller, we are passing in the state machine uh, controller. And you'll see why in an instance, but uh, the long story short, we need to pass in this value because we need to control the uh, state machine from this con uh, spider controller. And that is the setup uh, for this particular file. You'll note that in the init state, we call setup. And once setup is complete, we say is loading false. And this is just a Boolean that is uh, default set to true. And um, because we're calling set state, it will result in the build method being fired again. And if is loading is true, then we return nothing. If loading is false, then uh, we skip this and we just continue uh, to the next part. And that is the part that is rendering the spider. So if we were to restart this application, there might be a frame where things are still loading, but it probably loads so fast you wouldn't see that. And for now, we're gonna ignore this and instead just go into the widgets. So if we take a look at the first widget that we have, uh, this is the listener, and this is what allows us to get the pointer position 
and as well when we click. So you'll see that uh, we have on points are move, on points are hover. Uh, on points are move is if you click and uh, then move the position. So for example, if I click and hold and move, it still works. On points are down is uh, basically the mouse hover. Uh, oh, sorry, no. Uh, on, on points are hover <laughs> is the mouse hover. And on pointer down is the click events. So if it's a uh, right click, call right click on the spider. If it's left click, call left click on the spider. And we'll explore these in a moment. The set mouse position is a local method that we have here. And what this does, it sets the indicator uh, painter position. We'll see this in a moment. And then the spider target position. Let's take a look at this indicator painter because this, uh, this is quite simple. Um, if we take a look at the app, you can see that there's a, a small uh, black dot, uh, gray dot, that the spider is following. That is actually the precise position of the spider. If we move it really fast and actually click, it still works. Like the spider doesn't need to be there. We're just like pretending the spider needs to be there. And uh, this is just some visual indication to see where uh, the actual mouse cursor is and where the spider should walk to. And if we jump to this, you'll see that uh, this creates a class called Indicator Painter. And if we jump to that, you'll see it's a custom painter. And this is a Flutter widget. And we are drawing a circle. And we set the position. And this position we are updating in that method. So if we jump back, you'll see that we are setting the position equal to the position that is passed in. And that is determined by the listener over here. And you'll see if we scroll down that uh, here we have the custom paint and we pass in the indicator painter. And that is what paints the dot. And the rest of the widgets are um, quite easy to understand. If we take a look at the mouse region, this is how we set the cursor to not be visible. If we remove this line over here, you can see that the cursor is now Oh, I need to restart the app. You can see the cursor is now visible. So we're just using this mouse region to hide the cursor. And then we have a repaint boundary wrapped over our child. And the child is the UI page that we discussed earlier. So that's all the UI. And the reason I'm wrapping it in a repaint boundary is because uh, Flutter works in such a way that if you uh, call paint for anything, any reason, then everything within the same repaint boundary will be repainted. Which means that as the spider is walking along the screen, all of this UI is being repainted unnecessarily. Uh, wrapping this in a repaint boundary ensures that uh, this will only repaint the child widget if anything in the child widget is calling paint. So for example, if we hover over this reset, the color changes slightly, then everything in that context or paint uh, boundary will repaint. But as the spider is just walking uh, like and not interfering with any of the UI, we're ensuring nothing is repainting unnecessarily. Not too important for this app, but might be really important if you have complex uh, painting that happens in your normal Flutter uh, application. Okay, and then if we take a look, we can see that uh, we have this ignore pointer and ignore pointer does exactly that. It ignores the pointer. And the reason for that is because we don't want this uh, arrive animation to interfere with uh, us clicking. So for example, if you don't have that ignore pointer, uh, the arrive animation may be overlaid on top of it, which means that the touch events aren't being passed down. And then we have a transform. And this transform is what sets the position of the arrive animation. And this is controlled over here at the start of bold. And we will take a look at that in a moment. All you need to know is that each frame sets that is called. The transform position is different. And we render the arrive artboard in a different position. And here, if you are familiar with the arrive flutter runtime, we're not doing arrive animation. We are just using the lower level arrive uh, render object and passing in artboard. And uh, this is just a faster way to render. 
and it's because we already have the artboard instance and this artboard already has a controller attached and that controller is used within the spider controller. Quite complex, uh, but uh, yeah, that is that from the widget perspective. Okay, so now if we uh, scroll up, the main logic that we need to care about is the spider controller over here. So let's just search for spider. And you'll see that uh, in setup we created and then on tick we call the update method for spider. And that is where we pass in the delta time. And this value will be basically one divided by 60. Or it might be one divided by 120 if the refresh rate is 120 frames per second. But as you can see, this is the approximate value for one divided by 60. And this is kind of what we will get. It will be rounded to like, I think the six decimal or something like that. So let's jump into spider. And here we can see, uh, we require a state machine controller to be passed in. So we're passing this into the constructor. And then within the constructor, we are getting access to the arrive state machine inputs. So we have speed input, turn, rotate, left click, right click. And that matches all of these inputs that we have here. Okay, and the main method that we care about in this whole class is the update method. This is where we pass in the delta time, and this is what controls the uh, position and the rotation of the spider. And this is what updates those positions and rotation values and the speed at which it occurs over time. And we're not going to delve into each of the detail here. I do recommend you take a look at this yourself. Uh, one thing I should say is that uh, I didn't find these values automatically. It uh, did require some experimentation um, and uh, it's definitely uh, a process for anything like this where you start off slow, get it to do something basic and then getting, getting it to do something a bit more complicated. As an example, the first version of this uh, application, the spider was following the mouse position exactly. So there was no delay in like the sp spider getting to the position. It would move as fast as the mouse, uh, mouse moved. Uh, then I added the delayed movement. Then I added the delayed rotation. And then I added a little bit of extra behavior to ensure that uh, the speed is correct over time. So for example, that uh, the spider looks like it's moving slower if you move it a little bit and faster if you move it a lot, as an example. Same for the rotation and it was a lot of just experimentation and back and forth here. So I uh, do not feel like you should understand all of this. It's definitely much uh, more of a uh, best effort, see what happens if you do this approach. Um, but yeah, hopefully this can act as an inspiration for you to see how you can approach this. Okay, so um, without going into all of the detail, like I said, update is responsible for setting the position and the rotation. Um, for now, let's ignore this and this and just take a look at the rotation and position. One thing to note though is that we are getting the distance that the uh, spider is from the target position. So target position is the value that we set uh, outside. Um, if we take a look at main, and if we take a look at, um, where's that method? Uh, set mouse position. You can see that we set the target position to be equal to the mouse's current position. And um, it starts off at zero. And we get the difference of what the actual spider's position is to the target position. And then we calculate the distance on this offset. And using this distance, um, we are doing a variety of different things that we'll see in a moment. But uh, one thing to note off is that if the distance is equal to zero, that means the spider is exactly where it's supposed to be. So we just call reset values and return. And reset values are resetting the drive inputs. So the turn input, speed input, and the movement speed and rotation speed. I think actually might be worth it to set the move inputs as well, the rotation inputs, but I'm not gonna mess with this right now. Um, okay, so let's skip calculate rotation and jump into calculate position. 
in calculate position, we are passing in the distance, so how far the spider is away from the target position, and the delta time, so uh, the time between the previous frame. And here, the first thing that we're doing is we're setting the speed input. So that is how fast the spider is moving. And again, this is kind of just like me experimenting with the values and this is what I found to work. But this needs to be a value between zero and 100. And it's a f basically a multiplication on the movement speed. And this movement speed is a local variable that's initially set to zero. And we are adjusting this movement speed over time. And uh, this is the logic that this calculate position is just responsible for that logic of determining what the movement speed is. And this movement speed slowly goes from zero to a max movement speed. And this max movement speed is to set to be 300 because we don't want to ramp up the spider to be running immediately. We want it to be happening slowly over time. And that means that as the sp uh, speed of the uh, position changes over gradually over time, the animation should also gradually build up over time, which is the how fast the, the legs are walking. And you'll see that that uh, is the determined here. And that is ultimately the way that we also get the value of uh, the spider's position. And that is a, uh, a calculation by taking the direction of the spider multiplying it by delta time. And the reason we do this is just so that it smoothly interpolates over time because uh, one frame uh, may be faster than the previous fr frame or slower than the previous fr frame. And we want to take that into account. Uh, so in the event that there are frame drops, uh, it won't look too janky. It will uh, kind of account for any differences between frame uh, rendering times. And uh, you can read up more about that in general game development. But yeah, that is where the movement speed comes in. Uh, so the bigger the movement speed, the bigger the impact would be on the direction we're moving in, and ultimately a bigger impact on the current spider position. And if we jump to spider position, you can see uh, it's a public variable, and we are using this in the main method as well. Oh, actually we're not. Uh, let's see where we are using it. Oh, we are using the dx and the dy to get the x value of the spider position and the y value. And you'll note that uh, here we are calling dx and dy, and that is to uh, get the transform value. Okay, and uh, the rest of this, I'm gonna leave to you uh, to explore. Um, one thing to note is that we are clamping the value and this is was an experimentation as well. And that is because um, sometimes you want the movement speed to, uh, well, not sometimes, I want the movement speed to gradually decrease over time. So for example, if the spider is now a movement speed of like 200, once it uh, closes on the actual points that it's walking towards, I want it to go slower. and that is what this uh, min is doing here. So it's just taking the distance, multiplying it by two. This multiply by two is arbitrary. Uh, and it just gets the min value. So like over time, the speed will actually decrease. And that is that for calculate position. If we now take a look at the calculate rotation, you'll see that it's technically the same, but it's uh, just more complicated. One thing I did forget to say is that, uh, I, I did say it, but I want to point it out again, is that this speed input is the arrive state machine input for speed. And that is what controls how fast the legs are moving. Okay, so back to rotation. As I said, this is a, a bit more complex. Um, I think it's, it's probably outside of the scope of this video, but um, a lot of this is just, uh, kind of guesswork, seeing what works and what doesn't work. The main points to take note of is that we're getting the current rotation value and the target rotation value. And the current rotation value is the rotate inputs value. And uh, to remind you, that is uh, the rotation of the body, like this. And in the same way, we are 
also doing it for the, um, the turn value. And turn value is uh, this movement over here, moving from left to right. And the rest is just like determining what they should be adjusted to over time. Similar to movement, similar to position, but just calculate it slightly differently. You'll also note that there's this additional check over here that ramps down the speed if we are close to the correct rotation. So if we are uh, nearing the correct rotation, then we are slowly decreasing the rotation uh, speed over time. And one thing I'm gonna do right now um, is actually rename something. So I'm just gonna rename this rotation speed to turn speed. Uh, because initially I didn't have uh, the rotation input and the turn input. So turn speed is associated to the turn input, just to make that clear. One thing that also might not be too clear is uh, this code of, uh, that I have highlighted. What this does, it uh, ensures that the spider is following the most optimal path towards the rotation value. Um, what do I mean by that? Uh, it will be actually best to show you. So I'm gonna disable this code and just restart the application. If we move the spider, you can see it's working, it's working, it's working, it's working. And then suddenly it's not working. And the reason for that is uh, once we reach a certain rotation value, the spider thinks it needs to move the opposite way to get back or get to the optimal value. And what that, the reason for that is because if we take a look at this as an axis, um, the way this is set up uh, from a, calc like a math perspective is uh, zero is at the top right and then 180 is at the bottom right. And then minus zero is at the top right and minus 180 is at the, the bottom left here. And the moment you move a certain value, like if you rotate, 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 then it goes from minus 180 to 180. And the way the code is set up is it checks to see if the current rotation is bigger or smaller than the target rotation. So that means that it results in the spider moving the wrong direction. And all this does is uh, it just makes it in such a way that we immediately add the value to the rotation if that occurs. And that will ensure that uh, that movement doesn't, uh, or it will ensure that the spider knows the optimal route towards the uh, rotation. So now it's no longer doing that weird behavior. And one thing to take note of is I am making the turn speed uh, dependent on the rotation difference. And this rotation difference, I think we can also, ah, th that's a good name, and uh, we'll need leave that. Um, but yeah, what this means is that if you just rotate a little bit, it will immediately just like do things faster because those legs need to move a little bit faster just to like catch up with the rotation if the spider's really close to it. But if you're far away and moving it, then the rotation doesn't need to be a lot. But as it's close, you need the rotation to immediately kick in. So yeah, with that all said, um, I do think it's best to just explore this yourself and modify these values and see what happens if you change things. And then uh, you'll also get a better idea of how this works underneath. The thing that I didn't talk about is within this build method, we are getting the value of the X position for the spider, value of the Y position. And then we are transforming or creating a matrix transform, which is a translation on the, the DX pointer and DY pointer and a rotation on the uh, spider's rotation. And it's a little bit more complicated than you'd think. And the reason for that is because the center position of the spider is not where the mouse is pointing. The center is the center of its body, but you want the spider to be rotating at the front because if you click now, you want the click to be uh, in front of the spider, not in the middle of the spider. And a simpler version of this would have been um, if clicking wasn't uh, part of the functionality, would have been to remove 
this over here and this over here. Because what this is doing, it is using um, uh, trigonometry to just determine what the offset, offset should be for the animation to put it slightly behind the target position. So let's actually just remove that and it will be a little bit clearer what is happening. And now you'll see that the spider rests at, on top of the mouse position. So it's no longer clicking where it's supposed to be clicking. And hopefully that makes it clear why that piece of code is needed. Okay, I think that is that for this video. Uh, if you do have questions, feel free to ask in the comments or reach out on Discord. Um, uh, I'm excited to see what people make. Um, there's a lot of different uh, interactions you can do uh, for mouse cursors. Um, Spider is probably too complicated uh, to actually use in a real application, but um, a simpler version of this might actually be uh, usable in an app. I hope you enjoyed this video and uh, let us know if you have questions. Thanks for watching.